Welcome to our first of uh, our 2018 Environmental Speakers Series. Uh, it's so great to see such a good turnout. Uh, my name is Derek Pultney. I'm the Executive Director of the Ventura Land Trust. And for those of you who don't know, we just changed our name a few months ago from the Ventura Hillsides Conservancy. And back in 2003, a group just like yourselves helped create the Ventura Hillsides Conservancy. So it was community created. It's been community supported for 15 years as of next month. And even under duress during the fires, you guys have shown the Ventura Land Trust so much support. You guys are awesome, and I think Ventura is amazing. And um, I'm so glad to see everybody here. I think each one of us has a really heartwarming story about what has affected us this last month, and our hearts go out to any and all of us who have weathered the challenges of getting through this. I think things keep unraveling. And what we learned as a land trust is that we could help people more than we thought we could, and we learned that the community could help us more than we thought could be. And we thank you very much for your support. It's been 15 years of Ventura supporting us now. And when we have a group like this come together, it makes me feel great because members like you provide these educational programs at no cost. And we have such a, a wonderful speaker tonight, and I'm gonna go straight to that. In fact, Adrian, why don't you come on up here? Adrian's gonna do the shameless plug portion of the evening real quick. <laughs> Everyone, welcome. I'm so happy to see so many people here. We have, I see a lot of familiar faces and also a lot of new faces. So if you've never come to a Ventura Land Trust event before, we're glad to have you with us. Like Derek said, we've been around for 15 years. And I just want to tell you, we're a membership-based organization, meaning many of you pay us annual dues, and those dues go to help preserve open space in our town. So we appreciate those who are current members. We invite those of you who aren't to join us. On your chair is a membership envelope, as well as a little information about the Thomas Fire and how it affected us as a land trust. So although none of us thankfully lost our homes, we lost quite a bit at our Big Rock Preserve. And um, it was heartbreaking, but it will come back, and we're gonna hear more about that from our speaker. Um, but before we do that, I just wanted to thank and invite up Ish Goldstein. He's with California Solar Electric. They are a locally owned solar company and they're sponsoring tonight's lecture. So we just want to give them a few minutes to talk about California Solar Electric. Good evening, everyone. This is Elijah Bear. He's the owner of California Solar Electric. And uh, he's here to tell you that the future is solar. Uh, first off, yeah, I want to say, you know, everything we've been dealing here in Ventura County, um, heart guts out to all of you. I lost my home as a kid in the wildfire, and, um, and uh, we rebuild and get stronger. So, you know, a couple things I want to say about solar. Um, don't trust me. Uh, any Al Gore fans out here? <laughs> so, according to Al Gore, you know, mildly knowledgeable person about the environment, going solar on your roof is the third most important thing you can do in your lifetime for the environment. So, first one is know what's going on. Second one is vote responsibly. Third one is put solar panels on your roof. Yeah. So here's why. Average Ventura County system, which is going to be a little bit larger than Ventura City, offsets the CO2 equivalent from driving over 150,000 miles. You don't have to quit eating red meat. You don't have to stop driving. You don't have to stop visiting your family members who don't live here. You're just going to switch to solar power. You're going to grow your power. You're also going to conserve millions of gallons of water that are used to cool fossil fuels. That water becomes toxic. It then gets into our groundwater. It gets into our soil. You go solar, you just kick that problem out of here. So here's the third reason. The utilities. So the vision of solar is microgrids. Microgrids limit, uh, micro limit fires. 
So as we know, Santa Rosa fire, Creek fire, Koenigstein fire, utilities have been sued, they've been, they've been found li liable for them. When you're on a microgrid, you eliminate transmission lines in fire prone areas. We know now that utilities are threatening to shut down the transmission line to just turn off power during Santa Ana events. You go solar, you have battery backup, you have power. Microgrids means that when you have good solar access, you're going to send your power to your neighbor who doesn't have good sun access. We're going to eliminate those transmission lines. So, I'm going to challenge you guys. I know you've probably got robocalls from people and all that stuff. Um, California Solar Electric, we do not use telephones. I'm kidding. But, we've been around 17 years. Uh, it's like saying you've been in the solar business since, you know, like Henry Ford, since Henry Ford was a kid. Uh, uh, we're a mom and pop shop. And uh, we're not going to hassle yet. But I encourage you to look into it before the tax credit goes away. And um, it will, you will literally feel empowered. You are feeling helpless about what's happening. This is something you can do. Okay. And we're getting $250 for every sale from here to the land trust. If there's a number of you who are interested, come talk to me. I will find a price that's right for you, and we'll figure it out. Thank you. Yes. I'm here with them. Well, thank, thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, I'm here with my, my colleague on the city council, Eric Nazarenko, and uh, Eric and I are both proud members of the Land Trust. Uh, I think we both recognize that it really is one of our most important community partners from the uh, just really important work they're doing, uh, protecting open space uh, in perpetuity, uh, they have the great work they're doing out of Big Rock, the really exciting possibilities of Harmon Canyon, and everything they do is really turning to gold. Uh, it's just, we're, I know I'm very thankful to have a nonprofit like that working in our community. So thank you, Derek, and everybody at the Land Trust. Um, and just real quickly, I just want to say, uh, we, when I have roomfuls of people like this, I just want to kind of make a note just of how incredible this community has been in the past month. Um, this fire devastated all of us. Uh, it impacted us all in different ways, but the bottom line is it impacted all of us. In, in unique ways. And the resiliency and the strength I've seen from this community over the past month is just unprecedented. Uh, the friends stepping up for friends, strangers, I mean, everybody helping everybody has just been so uh, heartwarming to me. And so thank you all for being part of that. And I think it's really appropriate here from Dr. Anderson tonight because the one part of the recovery that we really haven't talked about is the ecological recovery. And, you know, our, our native animals, our native plants, uh, our ecological system, how is that going to recover? So that's why I'm really excited to hear what Dr. Anderson has to say tonight. Uh, but just thank you all for being here. Hello, my name is Kate Burlong. I'm actually one of the newest members of the staff for Ventura Land Trust. I'm the stewardship manager. I've had the pleasure of working with some of you out in the field already. I've studied under Sean Anderson uh -oh. at CSUCI, and he actually inspired me to come to this field. And I love everything that I do, and I thank all of you for coming out here to learn more about what we can all do together. And thank you for your donation. Sean Anderson is an expert in practically anything he looks at, so I feel like he's wow. <laughs> <laughs> one of the best people to talk to you guys tonight about this. And uh, with no ado, here is Sean Anderson. All right, you guys, let's, let's have a little conversation. Let me make sure I can get these guys all pointed correctly so I can see the screen. Awesome, thanks for coming out tonight. Um, this is really gonna be a first draft of what's going on. We're still, the story is still completely unfolding before our eyes, before your eyes. So again, this is really just the first pass. So I'll talk for 20 minutes, but I'm a professor, so that means about 40 minutes. And, uh, and then I want to leave a lot of time for questions. So, if you, so happy to hang out, and you guys can ask questions afterwards. After we finish the formal ones, I'll hang out after if you guys want to ask more questions. And, uh, and we'll do that. So I'd also like to say before we get going, it's, it's also really, really, really awesome 
and I'm very humbled to see so many friends and former students and community. Um, I think a lot of what's going on in our world today is about pulling people apart. And I think it's really, really cool that we live in a place where folks come together, not just in stressful times, but in, in regular times as well. So I'm very proud to be a part of this um, community here. And I wanna say thank you to all, all my colleagues and friends for the welcoming invitation tonight. So with that, let's talk a little bit about the Thomas Fire. So I'm just gonna ramble on for a bit. If something isn't clear, whatever, please interrupt me or ask a question. Oh, it's getting very intimate now. <laughs> That's good, I like that. That's good. Um, so uh, let's go ahead and start talking. So number next, pretty please. So um, so this is so this is first one is like a going to the eye doctor. This is an eye test. So we have a, a couple couple questions here. So this first one is um, I'm gonna show you a picture here and then another picture. Now these pictures are real actual true pictures, no fake news here. And this is, this is, uh, my question is, which is healthier? This is, in this case, it's not Ventura, this is the Sierras, but it's, it's a good proxy for us. So the question is, is this healthy or is this healthier? So what do you guys think? So it's the same exact picture, different time, but it's the same exact angle, same exact uh, uh, location. Okay, so let's see. Oh, let's vote. Let's actually vote. Democracy. So who says B? Who says B? About 50 percent, maybe 40. How about A? Oh, it's just like my students and everybody else copped out and didn't vote. It's <laughs> <laughs> interesting. It's interesting, right? Okay. All right. So the answer is number next. The answer is right here. This this one, the first one, is from 1964. The the main. The main uh, photo, this one up here was 1874. Uh, we would consider the 1874 to be, um, generally speaking, a healthier, better functioning ecosystem. This inset right here is the same exact location from 1994. Don't have any current pictures because you can't see it anymore. It's too clogged with trees. So we can't currently take a photo. So this is, uh, you, this is, you've set, this is uh, very close to Yosemite Valley. Right over here to the right, is a sketch from John Muir in 1894. And this is one of his books on, on California. And this is, it was a small sketch and I blew it up here and you guys might be in the back so it might be hard to see. But let me just point out right here, uh, these, are, these are folks on horseback right here. And so he's illustrating, in this case, uh, uh, what was to him in the, in the 1800s, late 1800s, a, a, a regular healthy natural occurrence. When John Muir would walk around, he could jump on a mule, he could jump on a donkey, he could jump on a horse, and ride through Yosemite Valley, like a park, no problemo. Number next. This is what uh, that area looks like today. Um, there's actually, there'll be a few more dead, you know, beetle-killed trees around, but, but, but this is what we have. You can't easily ride on a horse around, it's all clogged with stuff with underbrush, and that is absolutely a choice that we made, our society has made, starting in 1910 with the creation of the Forest Service and our modern policy of fire suppression. Number next. So this is some data, I, I won't give you too much data, don't freak out, but suffice it to say, this is from back in the day, if your eyes are old, it's just okay, it's olden days, and then 2000 is on the far right. There's a couple different metrics here, but these spikes, indicate uh, fires going on. And this is from um, a, a, a combination of about 800 different stands of forest across the western U.S. And, and so we have fires, 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 fires. And, and again, if you're in the back, if you had too many beers yet or whatever, it's okay. We just see there's a bunch of stuff over here and then it changes <laughs> right around. It's good, it's good right? It's good. Uh, it changes around 1900. And again, that's our fire suppression. Uh, efforts going in, and so this is this is basic ignition. Uh, this is basic, you know, fires and everything. And then, um, and, and this, can we get number next, pretty please? So we're changing the frequency of fire. We've been putting out fires actively, and this gets a little schizophrenic. So one that we're we're doing that at sort of the landscape scale, but then um, in places like right here, here's our Santa Monica Mountains, our, our California State University Channel Islands campus, right here on the end. This is the Santa Monica Mountains. And this is um, how frequently do we have fires in this particular uh, mountain range. And again, if you can't see the legend, that's fine. Hot means, uh, uh, you know, is, is where we're starting. And we go to the purple, which is really, really a ton of ignitions. 
And so if we look across the landscape, we see some, we see a lot of starting of fires. And so that's because we humans are integrated into the so-called uh, wildlands urban interface. So there's people driving their cars that might have a, a spark underneath their, their um, uh, exhaust pipe. It might be some kids, as in 2007, that went up to go drink at night and start a fire and then leave the fire and starts a big fire across the city of Malibu, etc. But we have this interesting combination of suppressing fire, so letting the so-called fuels build up. But then also, our activities are leading to, in certain areas, an elevated spark rate or an elevated ignition rate. Number next. All that comes together to produce this. So this is the top, as of this week, this is the top 20 largest wildfires in California state history. Now, we didn't start doing this until 1931. So the first data point on here is 1932. Um, if you want to have more beers with me later and talk about the history before 1932, there's an active debate as to what fires were like in the 1800s, but that's, that's a story that requires many beers. Um, but, but here what I've done is I've ranked these, these, obviously the Thomas Fire is the largest fire in recorded California history. Merry Christmas, you're welcome. Um, but if over here, so here I've ranked it by the year, and the, um, in the last decade, nine of the top 20, uh, of, the, of the 20 largest fires, nine of those have happened in the last decade. So these fires that are happening, something has changed. So that, that history of fire suppression, that combination of ignition sources has come together, and now we're in this era of something being different and these fires becoming these massive con conflagrations compared to what we had in the past. Number next. So this is the landscape before, obviously this is a Thomas fire, this gray, this gray um, area here, which we'll talk about in a second. But to, to set the context, these are our, this is, the, this is the halo of the previous fires that we've had, and I have the name of them, and then the, the year in which they began. And so the only reason why the Thomas fire wasn't even larger than it was, was because we had the Zaka and the Ray and some of these other guys that essentially lowered the fuel load uh, before then, number next. Okay, further setting the stage. Uh, this is on the left. This is one year ago this week. One year ago this week, we'd started this super wet year. We'd, it'd been raining since November, so we'd had a lot of rain. And so this is a measure of how intense our drought was at the time. Um, the colors, the, the, the hotter the colors, the more in drought uh, were we. And so what you see is Northern California already this time last year had left the drought condition. And you might recall the governor having all this pressure and different people saying, we've got to lift the drought, we've got to lift the drought, there's no more drought. There's no more drought up north, we still were in drought. Santa Barbara, Ventura are the epicenters of the worst part of the drought in the state. Um, the, the figure on the right is basically just a little before the start of the Thomas fires. This is mid-November data. And what you see is most of the state has left drought condition. To be sure, Ventura County, we were less, in less a severe drought um, uh, you know, as compared to uh, in January of that year. But nevertheless, we were still in drought conditions. We've never, our area has never left the drought in the past eight years. So when you read the stuff in the LA Times or the Sacramento Bee or the whatever, they're speaking of the average condition of the state. That is not us. We are obviously not average here in Ventura. Uh, number next. Uh, and, and as someone that, that uh, was an undergrad, when I used to be fit at one time many decades ago and I rode as an undergrad at UCSB and was the West Coast champion, thank you. West Coast champion, <laughs> amen, amen, thank you. Yes, you're not the block, that's fine. Um, rowing, we rode at Lake Kachuma. And I was an undergrad during this dip, during this, this low little level here. We would be rowing out in the middle of the lake and suddenly at 4.30 in the morning, the, the, our boat would stop and we would have run aground in the middle of the lake because the lake was dropping so low. It took until last year for us to get as, in as bad a condition. This notion of water stress is a key part of what's going on with, with the setup for the Thomas Fire, and it's going to be a key part of our recovery. So this notion of, of constantly changing water conditions seems to be with us uh, for the foreseeable future. Number next, pretty please. 
And so that's being set up. There, there's, there are many things going on here. But one of the key things is the same exact reason why my, two of my colleagues and my department were, were stranded in the Carolinas the last couple of weeks and could not come home from Christmas because they were snowed in. Snowed in in South Carolina, snowed in in Florida. And that's because we've massively distended the jet stream. So the jet stream this time of year, basically more or less, if you remember what the weather was like when you were a little kid or when your grandparents were little kids, it basically went from this side of the map over to this side. So it went from the west to the east. That's really not becoming the norm anymore. Really, for most of the, the lower 48, it's more of a north-south type thing. So that's what's leading to the eastern seaboard being frozen and freezing out. And we had this large um, high pressure system over us deflecting the typical rains that we, we, we would get, typically starting in mid-October, October 15th is the rule of thumb when we should start getting rain. And so this is part of the story, this climate change setting. As a scientist, I would say, well, we don't know if this is climate change. But really, this has all the fingerprints of climate change. What is happening here what, in the Thomas fires is, a class, is potentially a classic example of what, what our, how our planet is changing. Again, we have to sort of go several years in the future to make sure we see this pattern. But all of the models um, related to us pumping more and more carbon, CO2, and other substances in the atmosphere is leading to this much more noisy climactic system that gets, oh, I don't know, say two years ago, the driest year ever in history, and then last year, one of the wettest years in, in history, and then this past December, so far, that was the driest December we've ever had in recorded history in California. So that is not some weird thing, and those don't know what they're talking about. That's exactly what we predicted. Number next. And so that, that set up, right before the Thomas fire, that set up all this stuff. So the National Weather Service, our Oxnard-based office started sending out these warnings saying, oh my gosh, look out, elevated extreme, extreme fire danger, Santa Ana's crazy, everybody be careful. Number next. And that led to this, this very intense, as we all unfortunately know, these really, really intense Santa Ana conditions. We did not have a day or two or three of, of really, really windy conditions. We had two weeks of, you know, at sometimes 60 mile per hour winds. And that was a key part of why this fire was so fast and so destructive. Number next. So um, it is still under investigation. We don't know the cause of this particular fire, but I think it's safe to say, well, yeah, okay, so I don't wanna be political here, but I'll say that um, um, our current administration has rescinded the previous executive order that said when we have a disaster, we should build in a more resilient fashion. So if we go to, after a hur hurricane, Irma, whatever comes through, we should, we should you know, take things up a little, make, make them a little more uh, able to respond to whatever the natural disaster is. Our current administration has deleted that because that apparently isn't an important thing. Um, regardless, well, so whatever the outcome comes out as to what was the ignition sources for this fire was, I think we can all agree that having these massive high power lines in a landscape that has you know, 60 mile an hour winds, that's probably not the ideal condition. And so that means that our, not only our roads that we worry about, our infrastructure, but our power delivery system, all these things play into this. And we probably need to rethink how we move, for example, power around, around the landscape in this globally weirded world that we're inheriting. Number next. The other thing, um, as opposed to some of the, like, the control burns that, that I've done in the past where we have a regular nice day, calm winds, and we light some grass on fire and it does what it's going to do, this event was, as was uh, many of our most destructive fires, fueled by really, as were the Northern California fires earlier in the year, really, really intense um, winds. And so at some points we were getting 200 foot flame lengths, and at times the, the flames were moving at, at 30 miles per hour. So uh, it's, it's very, very easy because we don't have a history with this. So I, um, some of my students in the audience have come with me to New Orleans. We do work recovering from Hurricane Katrina and those events. And, and it's very, very common. We hear in these events, we heard it with Montes our, colleague, our friends in Montecito. Oh, I didn't, I didn't realize that the destructive power was, was, was as it was. And that's absolutely the case with this fire. This stuff runs, you know, goes faster than you can run out of the way. And so we're having these huge flame lengths. 
Um, and sometimes they went straight up, sometimes they went horizontal. Right. So we got a lot more, a lot more baking, a lot more flamethrower weed. That, is that flamethrower weed? I don't know if that's really a <laughs> word, but, but I'll just use it anyway. Um, so you know, we really got this, this, this different than uh, a quote unquote mellow, non Santa Ana type of uh, fire migration and fire weather. Number next. And so then, just to illustrate that, so this is, this is the fourth. This is satellite imagery, and this is what the sensor we have on this one NASA satellite that's designed for us to typically measure light pollution and to measure economic activity in places around the world. And so this is what it looked like uh, December 4th, number next. There's the next night. So the, so the Thomas Fire, go back a little to you, pretty please. There we go. So the Thomas Fire is like L.A. So Merry Christmas. So we got that going on too, right? So, so look how intense that is, right? So this is looking at the thermal radiation, the heat, the light that's coming off of, of this area. I mean, it truly was monumental in scale. We could see it from space. There was photos from the space station. I could show you pictures from satellites for, for minutes and minutes on end. Really, really impressive in terms of the scale of this. Number next. Um, and then this is a fire progression map. So we start with green and we go to red. And this is each day. So have a look at the green, though. The green is the first outburst. This huge run that starts up on the right and runs to the coast incredibly quickly. Again, fueled by these this bizarre jet stream, um, super adrenalized um, uh, Santa Ana's that helped run it all the way down to the edge of town here, as, as we all know. Number next. And we have, of course, the impacts that we, that we all uh, know about here in Ventura and around Ojai and, and a lot of our um, settlements, especially on the wildlands urban interface. Number next. Um, so immediately we, we worry about people just physically burning up, our property physically burning up. But as you know, as you all know, this changed life for, um, it's, well, it's changed our life for a long time, but, it, but approximately for several weeks, weeks, right? That's how everything looked for three weeks, right? Everything was that orangey, yellowy, kind of weird tone, kind of weird Hollywood horror movie thing. And when we went to go surfing, we had to wear, uh, well, hopefully people wore particle masks. I can't tell you how many people I ran into that were jogging in the midst of all this stuff, and I was like, you should have a mask on. Um, so there's those immediate health threats that, that we're faced with, number next. And, and that extended all the way, so our, our university has a research station now on Santa Rosa Island, and I've circled that with the, so our campus is, our mainland campus is there on the right. On the left is Santa Rosa Island. Santa Rosa Island was baking in this smoke, and it went you know way farther offshore than that. So again, these, these impacts were accruing and we're having impacts all over the place with this fire given the scale of it. Number next. Uh, so relatively complete burn as you can see here um, with a, a, a less um, intense burn. A lot of times we'll go out into grasslands or forblands in the wake of this fire and you'll actually see gr uh, you know, green plants still. The plants will typically rapidly die. One of the ways those plants die from from lighter or, or less intense burns is that actually the, the heat gets them. They don't char, they don't go black, they don't go brown, but the heat actually boils the liquid inside the leaves of these plants and we essentially steam them to death. But usually when it's a quick burn like that, it'll just take off the above ground leaves and the, the subsurface, the stems and the bulbs, those guys will persist. But in many cases, this, this, plate, this burn was so intense we actually took out some of the, the root material as well, and that would, and it, very likely that's the case in this particular uh, burn. Number next. So this is, now this is all preliminary stuff. So we've not been allowed uh, because, uh, so we fly various uh, robots and things up in the air to map things. Um, we have what's called a temporary flight restriction that the FAA has enacted over most of the burn so that firefighting aircraft can, can do their stuff, which is, which is great. That has not been lifted, even though the fire is officially contained and we're not flying firefighting aircraft. Um, it's just like gas prices. They go up very, very quickly, and they take a long time to go down the way. So, um, so we've, we haven't been able to do much. We've just worked around the perimeter here of Ventura, et cetera. So this is just first order approximation. So don't, don't hold me to this. But this is our best guess as to what, uh, how much burn. So herbaceous, that would be, that would be grassland and foreland. Shrubland would be small shrubs. Hardwood would be oak woodlands primarily. Mixed woodlands would be a mix of woodlands and, and conifers. 
And then conifers would primarily be our higher elevation up in the, in the cesspit, et cetera. Um, when you take all, again, super ballpark, so we don't have the data yet to properly compare, given that the fire was only 100% contained last week. But my, my rough back of the envelope guess, with my colleague, Dr. Tiki Patch, who helped me with this, I'm responsible for all the guesses. She's responsible for all the good science. Um, something like 3.6 million, we're guessing, something like 3.6 million tons of CO2 was emitted. What the heck does that mean? I have no idea. You don't know. That's a weird big number. But to put it in context, the most recent standardized data we have, verified data for the state of California, are carbon emissions from 2015. So if we use that, we release as, essentially as much CO2, we're guesstimating, as all the ship, shipping and boat activity in the state of California that year in 2015 from this one fire, um, or about 10% of all the emissions from all of our summed agricultural activity across the state in 2015. So that's a, it's a pretty significant amount of CO2 that, that went up in the air from this one event. Now, the, now that's a problem, but just to note, this, this CO2 was part of the ecosystem before. This wasn't fossil fuel. This wasn't adding to it, um, but it, it's confounding the problem. Number next. Okay, another interesting challenge we have here in Ventura that, that say our friends up in Northern California don't really have is all of our hydrocarbon history we have here in, this, in our county. So this is a, a pretty typical spot if anybody's driven the 150 between Ojai and Santa Paula. This is an oil seat. This is an oil seat that's on fire underground that you cannot put out. So if you throw fire on this, it just keeps burning and burning and burning. So it takes a lot of funky things to get it under control. Um, so this one was really popular. A lot of media covered this because you can see it just by driving by. Number next. This is uh, data from the state. This is from this agency called Dogger. And this is all of our oil and gas wellheads. So um, it turns out uh, Santa Barbara County, where the fire stretched into, uh, we don't, didn't have any wellheads where, where the fire was in Santa Barbara. So we're only looking at the data from our, our region of the state, which is called District 2. And about one quarter of all of the wellheads that we had were, were potentially exposed to fire. Now, they didn't all catch fire, but that was a huge impact. And if we talk about oil seeps, which are not, so our oil activities are typically, if they're a responsible player, they're going to clear all the weeds and make it relatively fire safe. Our oil seeps are not necessarily protected. And so it was about uh, one in five of our seats were exposed to fire. And we had, I haven't been able to get the most recent data, but it's on the order of 50, 50 of those seats um, at least were on fire at some point during um, the fire. And because we haven't been able to fly our drones, we don't, don't know how many are out. A lot of the ones close to roads are probably under control, but the ones that are farther in, it's unclear if those guys are still burning or not. Number next. Okay, so let's talk about something that you guys can help us out with. So, so another component, is a little bit about vegetation, a little bit about oil. What about the critters? Let's talk about critters for a second. So I'll just put a plug in. Um, if you guys saw stuff during the fire, if you saw, saw stuff just after the fire, if you saw stuff this weekend when you're out hiking, next weekend, do us a favor, tell us about it. So this is a chance for you guys to tell us what animal observations you have. A burned critter, a healthy living critter, whatever it is. So this is a, a web app. It'll work on your phone or anything. It tends to work a little more slickly on your, your laptop at, at home or desktop. But if you just type in bit.ly slash firekill, it'll take you to this thing. It's anonymous. You can report. And you guys can help us understand what's going on. And it's really, I think it's, it's really nice to have something that you guys can contribute. Sometimes, especially in the midst of the fire when everything was horrible news, horrible news, horrible news. To, to help you guys get empowered is really great. So one, you can do that. Two, you can come help volunteer at our next land trust uh, restoration activity. Number next. Okay, so uh, I just grabbed the data yesterday. So we've had about 85 people um, put observations in here, and, and many people have put many observations in, but, but we have had about 85 individuals adding data, and this is a distribution of where their observations were. Um, in addition to doing that, we do uh, tracking of wildlife. Some of, some of you guys in the audience are also part of this effort. Awesome. And we have a, a long-term roadkill uh, study. All of that is helping us understand what the animal impacts from this fire were. We're still in the very early stages, so it's evolving. But I want to tell you guys um, a story that has happened from the 2013 Springs Fire, which we think is an excellent model, and we're testing this now. So number next. 
So this is, this is uh, the big fire that came through our campus. Uh, very similar, not in scale, but, but otherwise very similar to how the Thomas fire progressed. So this is our California State University campus on fire in 2013, number next. This is an example of one of the landscapes before it burned, number next. And this is what it looked like. So you know, very similar to what we have here um, above City Hall and, and, and above Ojai, et cetera. Number next. So uh, it just so happens, because I'm a nerdy professor, I have, I have students, some of which are in the audience, that actually help with this. So we have an area right on campus that used to be called Camarillo Regional Park. Uh, now I'm supposed to call it University Park, but that's kind of a strange name, so we still call it Camp Park. But this is Camp Park. And let me, let me orient you here. So these are camera traps. These are, these are uh, really cool tools that are cameras that have infrared triggers that when a critter walks in front, it takes a picture. And so we use those to document the, the, the abundance and the diversity of wildlife that are around, in addition to doing uh, uh, sand traps and other tracking studies. But this data is just camera traps to make it simple. Okay, so here we go. On the left-hand side, we have the creek. So we have a riparian corridor going through the, the edge of our property. So that's the middle of the creek. So the next level over here, if it's too small, you can't read it, it's riparian. So this is just on the edge of that, of that water area. Then the floodplain near, near the uh, river and then farther, and then finally up the hills. So we're going from a transect from the, the wet river to upland as we go to the right um, in front of you. And on the, on the, uh, the axis here is just encountering. So we started in April 2011. This is obviously way before the 2013 fire. We had you know, critters, and we see a fair amount of critters, but any one camera, any one night doesn't necessarily get a ton of stuff. Then in the summertime, we see a little bit elevated, a few more encounter rates, but still you know, fairly low. Number next. And then I am not a pyromaniac, I swear to God, but it just so happens the week before the fire, we put out a bunch of traps. <laughs> so it was very convenient. Um, and so, so this is the data from about four or five days before the Springs fire happened. So again, this is just means it's very similar to this previous stuff. So it's, it's like going on like normal, number next. This is May right after the fire. And what we see is a huge spike in animal activity. Everybody is coming close to the river. You don't even need statistics. So I have error bars on here, but I've eliminated them so they're, they're easier for you guys to see. Everybody runs to the river. Uh, so this is, this is uh, again, immediately after the fire, number next. And then this is uh, a little bit later. Um, some of the numbers come down, some go up, but it's still elevated relative to the background number. So this animal activity, the distribution of critters, changes significantly in the wake of fire, number next. And then uh, within the next year, things generally go down, but still we have a lot of guys living in the river, many more than we otherwise would have. So if we went out before the fire, let's say we had a, a classic shrub, and the same pattern seems to be following um, the, the, the same pattern here in the Thomas fire, we maybe had a shrub and there may be, be a bird or two on that shrub. Now we come back in these remnant habitat areas that aren't burned or, or, or moderately burned, and there might be three, four, five birds on that shrub. And so, so these guys are like, at first, in the immediate way, it's like, what the hell happened, right? And they're just all kind of confused. And then as we go forward, they're having a harder time finding habitat, either hiding from predators or finding food uh, to eat. Number next. And so it turns out what's going on here is not all critters are responding equally. And then the most obvious pattern seems to be based on the size of the animals in terms of how they respond to this fire. So small animals, let's call them a mouse or a, a rabbit, those guys are in green, and those are here in green. And I'm sorry, okay, so this is, this is closeness to the creek. This is a slightly different way to show the data. So closeness to the creek, and then farther away from the creek. Uh, medium body things, that's gonna be your raccoons, that's gonna be your, your possums, guys like that. Those guys are in blue, and so they're kind of here. And then the large body guys are pink. That's gonna be your mountain lion, your deer, your coyote, those kind of guys. And what we see is, is uh, there, there's a good amount of, of the large guys and the medium body guys, but the small guys are really, they're the ones that really took it on the chin. Number next. So here's some camera trap uh, images. Uh, so this, this is from in the wake of the 2013 fire. Uh, here's a family of deer that are just hanging out in the naked trees. They're like, what do we do? What do we do? So they're, they're concentrating in there. Uh, coyotes, bobcats. What happened in the wake of the 2013 fire and what happened in the 2017 with the Thomas fire 
In the case of the 2013 fire, all the big bodied animals ran into the, the Oxnard Plains, the ag fields, and then went into the riparian quarters. Here, a lot of these guys ran into downtown Ventura, downtown Ojai, they ran into the core areas, and then have since either hung out in the urban cores or have retreated to the um, riparian corridors. Number next. The little bodied guys um, took it on the chin. So disproportionately harmed were the rats, the rabbits, those kind of guys. Generally speaking, the large bodied animals did okay, except for the babies. The baby deer in particular were nuked and, and, um, and those guys were hurt. So this is all, this is all 2013 fire, number next. Uh, this is also 2013 fire, so snakes, uh, wood rats, um, mice, number next. And then this is the Springs fire, excuse me, this is the Thomas fire. So this is, um, behind us up here in the hills, this is a juvenile mountain lion that burned up, number next. This is, this is a, a young bear cub. Number next. Sorry, I don't want to bother everybody up. Uh, here's a rabbit. So these guys didn't survive the fire too well, right? And again, large body guys generally okay, but these little guys, that's really where the big story is. So those guys that are really important for nutrient cycling, for, for, for you know, munching grass and all that kind of stuff, we've lost a huge chunk of those folks across the landscape. Number next. Uh, another, another mouse. Number next. Okay, so, uh, so that's a little bit about vegetation, a little bit about uh, uh, oil, a little bit about critters. Let's talk about, um, sort of to get into sort of what do we do, how do we respond to this. So here's how the firefighters responded. In addition to having about 2,000 odd firefighters from across the state, which was totally awesome, right, which really saved our bacon quite literally. Um, we also were joined by a whole variety of uh, firefighter aircraft and other equipment. In this case, these guys are dumping this phosgene, this, this, this fire suppressive liquid um, and, and, and foam type stuff, powder type stuff, to try to um, mostly along our ridge lines, which you guys can, we can still see that when we go around the CESPI, et cetera. Number next. Um, and, uh, and so we have done some mapping. So this next one, you guys have probably all seen this, but just in case, we have a little bit of aerial footage just to give you guys a sense just above Ventura. So this is one of our robots that we fly and we take really highly accurate pictures and then cre can create topographic maps and help predict things like um, where the vegetation might erode or where we might have landslides, that kind of stuff. Number next. And so hopefully this plays. Maybe this doesn't play. Is it going to play? That's OK. Um, so maybe give it a click. Maybe give it a, the mouse a click in the middle of that works. Oh, look at that, magic, multimedia. Okay, so this is, this is the Ventura Botanical Garden. And so we're going from, from, you know, inland towards the ocean. And what you see is everything is denuded. So not, not everything here is dead necessarily. Some of these guys will re-sprout, but those, you know, very steep hillsides, that's the challenge that we're facing now, as we learned with the Montecito. We'll talk about Montecito in a second. But that really <coughs> steep hillside and, and or, or steep slopes, that's the key challenge. Number next. So this is a satellite image uh, from December 18th. And you don't need any special statistics. You don't need anything. You can just tell how complete that burn was, that everything here looks brown where the fire went. And the little the remnant areas, the Ojai, the other pockets are relatively green. So we lost a massive amount of biomass in this fire. Number next. <coughs> Um, and then, of course, the story becomes, how do we respond to the rains that are coming? We have some more rain tonight. Thankfully, the rain we're getting tonight is going to be a little teeny dusting, and it's not going to be um, hopefully problematic. But again, just like before here, if we look up, we can see where the fire, and, and the black line is the perimeter, the burn perimeter. Um, you can see, so up there is, is the burn, and then down below is the, is the area that did not burn. Number next. Um, so it's important to say that, that we, we can't accurately predict um, where the mudslide is going to happen, but we can pretty darn well predict the places where it might happen. And so in the wake of Montecito, there's, there's been a lot of discussion about well, why didn't they tell us about this, they should have done this and that. Um, I just want to say that the science behind this was solid and was communicated. So first let's just talk about what happens when the fire happens. So on, on the upper left here, we'll start. So here we go, we have the fire, uh, or excuse me, pre-fire. We have, we have roots and things like that, we have leaves. The fire comes in, converts that stuff to CO2, it, it goes up in the air. And, and so one, that, 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 that organic material goes away. Two, the heat, the actual heat of the fire oftentimes will bake the soil. And actually, it has to do with some of the gases that are in the soil. But basically, it makes the soil more impervious 
to water penetration. So it makes it so-called hydrophobic. So that when we get the rains happening, it's not just that the slopes are steep and that the water runs off. It's also that the water has physically a lot harder time getting into the soil. You know, interstitial spaces, it's a lot more difficult. So the ideal condition is if we would have something like we're having tonight, a little teeny bit of fire. I'm sorry, I'm too Wow, I need some more beer is what's going on there. So we need a little bit of rain, a little bit of rain, and then a little bit more, and then a little bit more, and then, which has been the historic pattern, right? Rule of thumb, October 15th is when the rains come. And then a little teeny light rain, a little teeny bit around Halloween, a little teeny bit of this, so that by the time we get to the real heavy rains around Christmas, New Year's, the little grass and plants have, have germinated and have started to hold the, hold the, um, the ground together. Um, obviously, that did not happen with our first rains. It was a huge downpour right out the gate. Um, but again, just to say that we know what's going on. So this image over here on the right is just steepness. So the hotter the color, the more steep the hillsides, and that's where the, that's the danger comes in. This on the, on the left is what we didn't know before Montecito. This is real data after the fact. This is the most intense rains. So this is where we had this just dumping of rain and the technical definition is more than 24 millimeters in 15 minutes, but you guys don't care about that. That's just a huge downpour is the worry at one very you know, narrow uh, slice of time. Number next. So here are the maps that came out on January 3rd. These are produced by the USGS, and they were distributed around to everybody. Anybody can look at them. And a little hard to see here, but just suffice to say, it's going from yellow, which is, oh, I might have a slide, to this is 80 to 100% probability of if we do have a downpour, that will cause a catastrophic flow, a catastrophic landslide. So these risks are very real, and they are understood, at least in potential, in a potential case. Uh, so the National Weather Service starts putting out these warnings, saying, hey, watch out, watch out, watch out. Number next. And then the media starts picking up. This particular map is from the LA Times. So this is on January 4th, and they say, hey, these are, and they, they, they do a little bit different visualization for the general public, because all that, those percentages and stuff for scientists is a little crazy. They low, medium, and high, and they say, watch out for this, number next. And then we come out with, uh, on 11, by 11, the morning, the, the morning before the rains really go to town, with these mandatory and voluntary uh, uh, evacuation warnings. It would have been great if, if, the, if, all, if all of them had been mandatory, but, but nevertheless, that was, that was what the warnings were. Number next. And then this is after the fact. So this is maybe some of you have seen this. This is a crowdsourced Google map that folks started. Last time I checked, it had about 400,000 views. It was started about five days ago. And what the dots here represent, these are, 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 are publicly, you guys, maybe some of you guys contributed to this, crowdsourced damages. So where is the house destroyed? Where is the house completely destroyed? Where is it partly destroyed, et cetera? Where did someone pass away, et cetera? And so again, this is Montecito. Down here is the ocean. And what this blue is, these are the riparian corridors in the 100-year floodplain. So it's, it, while there was damage all around, to be sure, and, our, and right, the 101 is closed still and all that stuff, but clearly the, the, the major damage is concentrated in these riparian corridors and so, um, again, I really want to emphasize, if you don't take anything else away tonight, if you guys do live in one of these areas, wherever, wherever it is you guys reside, you need to take these warnings seriously. Whether they say mandatory or whatever, err on the side of caution. If we're getting some heavy rains, go stay in a motel or go hang out with some friends. It's not worth taking a risk if you're anywhere near one of these, one of these areas that are potentially, even theoretically, vulnerable. Don't take the chance. Number next. This is just a, a couple shots of the magnitude. I mean, this is crazy stuff, right? This is crazy, crazy, crazy stuff. This is an underpass in Montecito, and these guys, these firemen are like, what the hell do we do with that? <laughs> Number next. <laughs> this is a road. That boulder is in a road. This is crazy powerful forces here. And it, I have some videos on my YouTube channel illustrating some of this stuff, but, but suffice it to say, um, these forces, you cannot win. You, you cannot go against this. It's like being in a hurricane. So the answer is, if you guys, again, are in one of these areas, and we, we are getting ready for some rains, go ahead, go get a hotel, go get a motel, go stay with friends. Don't, there's no way you're going to be able to fight uh, some of these forces. 
um, in the foreseeable future until we get some erosion control measures going on. Number next, pretty please. Um, so now this is not a real bear. Well, it's a, no, no, that's a real bear. Let me say that. Differently. So this is a bear, but this appears to have been a stuffed bear that blew out of somebody's house. So lots of people sending this picture, but it is not a real bear on the beach. I don't think. I could be wrong, but I don't think. So that's not in my database. That's not in the uh, in the, in the fire <laughs> database. But um, but let's so let's talk about what's going on with our beaches and other things. Number next. Okay. So this is Carpinteria. And uh, now this is a controversial thing. So I just have some questions for some reporters, and they want me to say something scandalous or whatever. <laughs> but um, uh, so the idea here is that we have a bunch of stuff. This happens every disaster. When we when we have our big earthquake, which is going to happen, we're going to face this. Uh, you know, Hurricane Irma, Hurricane Katrina, this always comes up. All of a sudden, we're in a disaster context. What do we, this is a non trivial question, what do we do with this debris, right? Sometimes it's just mud and dirt, sometimes it's other gunk and toxic stuff from the homes. It, it's a hard call. What, what uh, our agencies and authorities and municipalities have, have decided to do is to essentially move, um, and this is, this is most problematic, obviously, in Montecito, where we're still clearing the 101. The idea that they, what they've done is they've secured permits from the various federal agencies, uh, the Coastal Commission, et cetera, to allow them to discharge this stuff onto beaches in two locations, two main locations. One is in Carpinteria right here, the other is in Goleta Beach. Goleta Beach probably makes sense. Goleta Beach is eroding, and they're having a problem. They need more sediment, so that's probably okay. Uh, a little bit maybe different here in Carpinteria, do we really need all that stuff? And so what they're doing is they're coming up and it's about every four minutes, a dump truck is coming up right here and is dumping out, as you can see in this picture, is dumping out a load of, of slurry, mud, slush stuff, ash, mud, or whatever it is. And they dump it out. There's a guy that's supposed to be watching that. If there's any rocks or, or logs, he or she will, whoa, let's pull that out. But then once it's dumped there, the bulldozer guy gets on it and shoves it into the ocean. Excellent. Okay, great. So um, don't go swimming or surfing in the next uh, few days or so. So, so for Santa Barbara at least, the f 48 miles of Santa Barbara coast are currently um, closed for swimming. Um, and it's because, one, we're just worried about the storms, but, but it's clearly they're freaked out about all this stuff that's going into the water. It's, it's mostly just sediment, but again, in a disaster context, it's hard to know what everything is. But that is, that is where we are right now. Number next. Um, and okay, so then to finish up real quick, just a couple slides about stuff that you guys can do and how you guys can be proactive, what we can do. So I just said, oh man, this whole, all these landscapes are denuded, all this stuff is, is nuked, what can we do? There's a lot of things we can do. Number next. So here is uh, uh, one of uh, our uh, land trust's lands um, that we just had. Uh, uh, planting day at Martin Luther, on Martin Luther King's birthday last Monday. And so one thing that happens whenever we have a fire is we see some of the detritus of our society. We see where the bottles the guys threw were, we see some of the junk is. So one that gives us an opportunity to get that stuff out, right? That otherwise this might be covered with shrubs, might not see it. So there's a, a, a huge need for you guys to come out and help um, on our various land uh, ownership sites and, and help us clean that stuff out. That's one thing. That's a relatively easy, relatively quick thing, sort of one-time thing. Number next. Um, but then we have all this, all this landscape that is, that is great. With, with over 440 square miles burned, we are not going to be able to actively restore the whole, whole area. Um, but that means that the areas that we do have some control over, uh, Ojai Valley uh, Land Conservancy, um, Ventura Land Trust, some of our state parks, some of our federal lands, those areas where we have control over, we can pick some of these focal areas and the land trust lands are some of the best ones that we can focus our effort. So we can't plan over 440 acres or 440 square miles, but we can do some nucleating sites. We can put some focused plants that will help reseed the area. We can provide some habitat re refuge for some of these critters. And so that's what um, is a great opportunity you guys can engage with, number next. Um, in addition to, to learning about you know, the natural world, this fire has also given us an insight into some of our own human history. So right behind, the, um, right behind City Hall, we've discovered all these additional aspects that went in with the mission. 
So we have all these walls we didn't know existed, all these, all these terraces that were, were covered with plants for the last 150 years. So while it would be nice to have the plants still there, um, this is a unique, uh, there is something positive here that we're getting new insight into our history here in Ventura with some of this. Number next. Also, stuff is coming back, right? So it might not come back super or as fast as it otherwise would because of the drought, but there's some possum tracks and some raccoon tracks um, at Big Creek uh, on Monday. Number next. Um, and then some of our plants, so again, this is uh, right in front of us is the 33. This berm is on the 33. So the fire wasn't quite as intense here as in some other spots. And what we have growing up there is what I think is wild rye. It's a little hard to tell. So our grasses pop back really quick. For our native grasses, that's great. For our rundo, everybody say boo. Exactly. So for our rundo, we don't like it, but our rundo pops back quickly too. However, it gives us an opportunity and our, and our, our colleagues and our friends that work on that to really easily control that. Right, just do a little focus herbicide, a little focus control that otherwise would be really hard. So the fire not only shows us landscapes that are new, it also shows us where some of the bad guys are, and we can sort of ta target them much more quickly. Number next. So your guys, staff guys, already know this. If this is your property, we're really worried about the, the erosion stuff in the immediate short term, the next few weeks. So if you guys have any of these sites, you want to nail them really, really quickly. Um, as fast as possible, sandbags, all that kind of good stuff. So the question that most often gets is, should we do sandbags or number next? Or should we do hydro seeding? Hydro seeding is is, requires beer and requires us to talk about it. But <laughs> most of, so the idea with hydro seeding is what you're seeing here, there's little teeny seeds in this mix, and then this is a cellulose, uh, a, a matrix, and then green food color. And so this is basically, the idea is here, throw some seeds down and then throw this this uh, sort of covering over it, again, with the hope that we initially have a little bit of light rain, the seeds start to germinate, they get a little bigger, a little bigger, a little bigger, and so then by the time the big rains come, they've actually set the roots. Obviously, with, with our first rain, that did not happen. Whatever we put probably got washed out, right, from the intense downpour. The problem with this is these are only, if you just buy the default stuff, this is all non-native fescues and things that we don't necessarily want. Yes, very a boo. I like the boo. It's good. You guys are a good crowd. Um, so, uh, so, the, but the problem is that stuff is relatively cheap. So, especially if we're in a disaster context and we need some help with their, with the contractors to deliver to you, are these non-native grasses? Um, I would just suggest that it's not always clear that that's the best thing to do. If you are worried. You could actually have them spray this tack. You could have them spray this, this binder without the seeds. If you want a little bit of covering on the hillside, probably better, although again, I understand that it gets into money and how much time, but probably better to do waddles and do essentially some, you know, essentially terracing of the hillside rather than do this stuff. Um, but again, that requires several beers and we have to talk about, talk about it. But, but a common response is to do hydro seed. Um, but why not just go and get some stuff and start actively planting, as uh, the land trust has been doing uh, already. And so in this case, this is our area looking towards the creek. And here was on Monday, and, and I've been planting a coyote bush, all that kind of good stuff, and get these guys in the ground. Um, it's a perfect time to plant stuff right now, right? Because we plant in the summertime, you got to water the hell out of them, get them going. Now, get them going, water them a little bit in, but as we get, hopefully, more rain, right? That's, that, that'll get these guys started really well. So, so active planning in places like um, our, our protected areas, like your property, it's the perfect time to do that right now. Number next. And so with that, I'm gonna stop. And I know that I, I rent went so long, all right? That was a 20 minute, professor 20 minute? <laughs> so, um, so that's my quick overview of what's going on with the fire. Again, this is a work in progress. Over the next couple weeks and months, we're going to get a lot more clarity. And you guys are welcome to talk to us or, or give me a ring if you want to know how things are unfolding. Thank you guys.